All right, everyone, it is now one o'clock, according to uh, my clock anyway. So we're gonna go ahead uh, and begin. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, our program is gonna be called our Tour of the November Skies. Um, we'll be highlighting some things that you can find in your sky tonight and throughout the entire rest of November, highlighting planets, stars, constellations. We'll be talking uh, a little bit about the origins of the solar system today. Uh, and some important news that's happened uh, over the past few weeks in the world of astronomy. Before we do begin, a few uh, housekeeping things. Uh, as always, if you have any questions uh, that you would like uh, us to answer, you can write them in the comments uh, section uh, uh, of our of our uh, live stream here. Um, I've got my colleague Mike, who many uh, who many of you know, uh, will be answering questions in the comments today. Uh, and I'll be answering your questions as well during the show, and we'll leave some time after the show to answer your questions as well. Um, this, uh, uh, after today, um, we're changing up our schedule a little bit uh, in, in terms of uh, when we're doing our planetarium online shows due to uh, us reopening the planetarium. Um, we're gonna be changing to doing shows once per month um, usually the first Thursday of every month at 5 p.m. Um, so that will allow us to, to really take more of a deep dive into specific topics during our shows. Um, so we're planning on doing them, again, the first Thursday of every month at 5 p.m. Um, we might move the show around in, in case there's a really cool event happening in the sky or some breaking news that we re really want to cover. Um, so to keep track of when we're doing our Facebook live streams, uh, just uh, you can you can uh, like us on Facebook and we'll, uh, we'll post any updates there as well. But um, our next show uh, will be the first Thursday of December, December 3rd, I believe, uh, at 5 p.m. Um, also this weekend at Liberty Science Center, we're having a, a, a celebration, a really big celebration uh, uh, of the Rubik's Cube uh, and uh, our Beyond Rubik's Cube exhibit. Um, Krista, who many uh, uh, of you know, uh, made an 80s uh, music laser show that'll be showing in the planetarium uh, going on all weekend. Uh, we have brought back our popular planetarium show, Black Holes. Uh, for the first time in what feels like a year, uh, uh, I mean, almost a year uh, uh, at this point. So lots of really cool stuff going on at Liberty Science Center uh, th this weekend. Uh, we're, we're also open uh, extended hours tomorrow, and I'll be in the planetarium most of the day tomorrow. Uh, so, so if you'd like, you, you can come stop by and see our shows in the Big Dome. Uh, one more final thing, though, if you would like to support our Planetarium online streams, the best way you can do that is using our donate button, which is somewhere around my head, uh, if you're able to, and, and if you would like to make a donation to Liberty Science Center to help us uh, uh, continue putting on these Planetarium online streams. So, with all of that, let's go ahead and uh, get started with our show. I'm looking over at our, uh, at our sky. So this is what the sky would look like right around now if you poked your head outside from my window here in Jersey City. It's nice and sunny, not very many clouds in the sky. The same thing we can see here in our simulated uh, planetarium night sky as well. But right now, all we can really see is the sun. So to see much else, we're going to need to wait until after the sun has gone down, and we'll then be able to see a little bit more out in our sky. So we're looking here about two hours uh, after sunset at around 6.45 p.m. Um, and that'll be around the same time any night during the month of November. Now you'll know you're looking toward the west because that is where the sun always sets in the sky. Right now it's, uh, it's setting a little bit north of west, but still over in the western sky. And November, and a little bit of December is going to be your last chance to see one of my favorite groups of stars in the sky. That is called the Summer Triangle. So in your sky, it'll look just like a, just like a triangle of stars. So three pretty bright stars that are sitting a little bit above the horizon uh, over toward the west. So the Summer Triangle is made up of these 
three stars right here. These three stars, of course, have names of their very own. These stars are Deneb, Vega, as well as Altair. Now, in this sort of trio of stars, each of them is a part of its own constellation as well. So, for example, Vega is a part of a constellation that uh, right now, when we draw out our little stick figure of it, it kind of looks like a kind of looks like a bow tie almost, like a really crooked kind of bow tie. Looks like a fish sometimes to me as well. Uh, is the shape of a constellation known as Lyra the Harp. So Lyra uh, the Harp is going to be uh, getting very low in the sky as November goes uh, goes along. We can also see uh, the constellation of Aquila the Eagle, a little bit over to the left, containing that bright star Altair. But my favorite of this trio of summer triangle constellations uh, is the uh, kind of the one that makes the most sense to me in terms of uh, the stick figure compared to what the constellation's actually called. This is the shape of a swan named Cygnus. And Cygnus is my favorite of these three constellations because we actually can find a couple of black holes inside of Cygnus. Now, if you've ever uh, seen me doing one of these Planetarium Online shows, you'll know I love black holes. Um, and inside of this constellation was the first ever black hole that we discovered, known as Cygnus X1. There's also a black hole in this constellation uh, that's kind of a personal favorite of mine. That constellation is named V404 Cygnus, located a bit up and to the left of Cygnus X1. V404 Cygnus is one of my favorites because it was actually uh, a black hole that I studied a lot when I was in college. Um, and so they're both in the sky right now. Now, because they're black holes, you cannot see them with your eyes, right? You can't see them, but they are there. So if you step outside facing toward the west, uh, uh, give Cygnus X1 and V404 Cygnus a, a, uh, a wave from me. So even if we can't see them with our eyes, we can still observe black holes, or at least detect black holes, like Cygnus X1 and like V404 Cygnus, because they have very bright things going on around them. Both of these black holes are close enough to a star that the black hole's gravity is actually slowly tearing that star apart. Just kind of a kind of a kind of a scary sounding thing. But it happens. This black hole's strong gravity pulls gas off of this companion star. That gas then falls in, gets awfully close to the black hole. Some of it gets eaten by the black hole. Other bits of it end up in this big disk of gas. This big disk of gas gets really hot. We're talking like hundreds of thousands of degrees Fahrenheit. And that means it starts to glow. And we can observe the glow coming off of this disk of gas using X-ray and radio telescopes from here on the Earth, which lets us know that those black holes are there. So that's how we found Cygnus X1, which was the first black hole we found, and how we found V404 Cygnus, and how we learn more about them. So even though your eyes can't see them, they are up uh, in this part of the sky. Cygnus X1 and V404 Cygnus, both kind of toward the, kind of by the neck and the wing of Cygnus the Swan. So this right here is the western sky, right? Um, I would say the summer triangle is the best thing to find over in the western sky. We're going to now, though, rotate ourselves around and face toward the south. Because tonight in the sky, and throughout all of November, there are three planets that you can find in the sky right after the sun goes down. So there are three planets that you can see in our sort of simulated sky here right now. We're facing toward the south. Two of the planets are located a little bit toward the west. So over in this part of the sky, the first planet we're going to at least point out today is this bright point of light 
right here. We'll draw a, a little marker around it for us. This is the largest planet in the solar system, the planet Jupiter. Now, you may have heard before that Jupiter is the largest planet, but that's kind of a hard thing to keep in your mind, right? When we say it's the largest, well, what does that really mean? How big is it? Well, I think it's useful to compare it to the size of our own planet Earth. If we took Jupiter and took the top off of it and took a bunch of planet Earths and lined them up inside, 11 Earths would stretch from one end of Jupiter to the other. So Jupiter is about 11 times the diameter of our planet Earth, which is pretty big, which means over a thousand Earths would fit inside of the whole great big volume of Jupiter. Because it's so big, well, that's why it looks so bright in the sky. So even though Jupiter is really far away from us, right, Jupiter is a few hundred million miles away from the Earth, it still shines nice and bright. So Jupiter itself, um, would take about five million years, or five, five, five years for us to travel there using a rocket that's launched from the Earth. Five years to get from the Earth to Jupiter, not five million, five years. So we haven't sent people to Jupiter because it's too far away. We do send robots there though to help us explore it. This right here is the Juno spacecraft, which has been orbiting Jupiter for the past few years and we'll continue to do that for, uh, for about the next year. Now, Juno is an interesting spacecraft because it spends most of its life really far away, millions and millions of miles away. But every 53 days, it gets close. Now, it does that because Jupiter has a lot of radiation that comes off of it, and if Juno spent too much time up close to Jupiter, it would, it would stop working very quickly. So it has to stay away from Jupiter um, for most of its life. But Juno is not the only tool that we use to study Jupiter. We also use telescopes that are either based on the Earth or that are controlled from the Earth. For example, the Hubble telescope, which is one of our space telescopes, recently took this incredible picture of Jupiter. And I love this picture because of everything we can see in it makes Jupiter look very colorful as well. We can see in this picture the largest storm that Jupiter has, which is called the Great Red Spot. Um, this Great Red Spot is about the size, of, is actually a little bit bigger than our planet Earth is today, and is over 400 years old. Down below the Great Red Spot, though, we find another storm. Um, maybe we can call it the medium uh, white spot. Um, but this storm has been growing over the past few months, and who knows, maybe soon it'll be even larger than the Great Red Spot. We don't really know. This picture was taken uh, toward the end of September, and we're always keeping track of how these storms on Jupiter change. So Jupiter is going to be up in the sky um, all of November, right? Any night in November, you can step outside as the sun goes down, and you can find Jupiter. Sitting directly next to Jupiter, over to the left of it, we can find another planet. This planet is a gas giant. Um, it is further away from us than Jupiter. And it is a planet that has rings. Now, I'm sure most of your minds immediately went to the planet Saturn, which is exactly what this planet is. But there are two other planets that are also gas giants that have rings. Those would be Uranus and Neptune. But in our sky tonight, right next to Jupiter, we can find the planet Saturn. But Jupiter itself also has rings as well. But we know Saturn's rings best mostly because of what they are made of, right? And, well, also because they're really, 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 really big. So to, comp to show you how big the rings of Saturn are, I'm going to put up the, a little model of our planet Earth here next to Saturn. And we'll put up, to give you a sense of how, how wide they are, a little scale model 
of the distance to the moon, which is over here. The rings of Saturn would almost stretch all the way from the Earth to the moon, about 175,000 miles from end to end. But that's not the only reason why the rings of Saturn are so bright. It also comes down to what they are made of. So, in space, things like rocks and dust don't reflect light super well. But, but ice reflects light extremely well. And it just so happens that Saturn's rings are mostly made of ice. Little, little tiny chunks of ice and rock that used to be part of a moon before this moon got a little too close to Saturn and was then ripped to pieces by Saturn's really, really strong gravity. But even though Saturn's rings are made of little pieces of moons, we also find moons inside of Saturn as well, or inside of the rings of Saturn as well. This moon here is named Pan. It's a bit more massive than the stuff around it, so it makes this big sort of, this sort of gap inside the rings. So as we fly through the rings of Saturn here, we'll eventually move to one of Saturn's moons, the moon Titan. I want to take a moment and see if there's any questions that we can answer that have come across in the chat so far. Um, so uh, Sarabi wants to know, can we see Jupiter uh, in the whole month of November? And can we see Mars the whole month of November? Absolutely. Any night in, uh, in November, you can step outside, you can see Jupiter, you can see Saturn, and you can see Mars. We'll see Mars in just in, 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 in just a little bit here during the show. But any night during November, you can see Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. So it's a great month to find planets. So let me see, any other questions that we have? So uh, Christy wants to know, is the Earth closest to Jupiter? So, um, so right now, I believe, the closest planet to the Earth is Mars right now. Though it might be Venus, I'm not sure. Um, but usually, uh, Jupiter is 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 not the closest planet to the Earth. The Earth is the third planet, and Jupiter is the fifth planet. So usually, Mars or Venus is closer, or Mercury even is closer to us than uh, than than Jupiter is. Let me see. So Victoria wanted to know how many Earths could fit inside of Jupiter. Uh, it's around 1,300 Earths would fit inside of Jupiter. So it's, uh, it's pretty big. Oh, and I'm also reading here that, that, that it is uh, Julia's birthday this month. So a uh, uh, happy birthday month. Um, uh, it's also my brother's birthday later this month. And uh, one of my cousins too. So uh, November's a wonderful month for birthdays, I think anyway. So let me see if there's any other questions that have come across so far. I, I did see one question earlier about a comet um, that might be visible in November and December. Um, that comet, uh, I believe, is only visible in the Southern Hemisphere, um, and it's probably going to be really, really faint. So it'd be a tough thing to find. Um, but I believe it's only visible in the Southern Hemisphere. So we won't be talking much about it today. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, let's see, so uh, Liko uh, wants to know, is Titan the biggest moon of Saturn? It absolutely is. Saturn, or sorry, Titan is the biggest moon of Saturn and is the second largest moon in the entire solar system, which is pretty cool. So any other questions that, that have uh, come across so far? So uh, Elio wants to know if we can see Galileo's moons. Let's actually see if we can do that real quick. So the, the Galilean moons uh, are four of Jupiter's brightest moons. Um, the first four moons that we, that we ever found. So those Galilean moons, kind of switching gears here a little bit, moving back to uh, Jupiter, 
are uh, Io, Europa, uh, Ganymede, and Callisto. These are the four Galilean moons of Jupiter. And if you've got a pair of binoculars at, at home or a telescope, you can actually point them at Jupiter and you can see uh, at least three, uh, sometimes four of, uh, of these moons with your very own eyes using a telescope or a, a decent pair of binoculars. Those, so those are the uh, Galilean moons um, of Jupiter. So moving back here into our southern sky, we'll talk about the planet Mars in just a moment. But there are some, uh, some very bright uh, fall time, November constellations that we can see up in the sky tonight. So we, we mentioned the summer triangle earlier. To find our next constellations, we're gonna actually kind of look almost directly above our heads. Let me actually highlight the summer triangle once again, which we can see over here. November is a great month for finding some pretty simple shapes of stars in the sky. So we see the triangle here, the summer triangle. Um, but going along with the summer triangle, we can also find the fall square. So these four bright stars down here are a part of a shape that we call the, the fall square, the square of autumn, or sometimes uh, I've also heard it called the square of Pegasus. Because these four stars in this square are a part of the constellation Pegasus the flying horse. So if we take the four stars of our square, add a couple more stars, we can make a head here, we can make a couple of legs, and together we can draw out the whole shape of Pegasus. Now facing toward the south, Pegasus uh, is gonna be kind of upside down uh, uh, in the sky tonight, but that's okay. There isn't really an upside down in space, so I think Pegasus is, is doing just fine. So I did see a question earlier. I apologize, I did not. Oh, Audrey wanted to know, how do constellations form? That is such a good question. This is kind of a good place to, to talk about that. So constellations are things that are created by people. So we look up at the sky and what we see are just a bunch of stars. And people love to make patterns out of things, and people love to draw pictures. So when we look at a bunch of scattered dots in the sky, one of the first human instincts is to try to make sense of them by drawing them into shapes. So people have been doing that literally since there have been people. For thousands and thousands of years, people have drawn shapes out of the stars that they see. Now, the constellations are just an official set of these pictures that are recognized by astronomers. So Pegasus is one example of a constellation. Um, different cultures around the world, though, see these same stars as different things. Most of the constellations come from ancient Greece or from ancient Rome. Um, so that's, that's mostly what astronomers talk about. But, but any, but uh, most, uh, most uh, uh, Native American tribes, for example, have different pictures that they draw in the sky. Um, so every culture around the world has their own way of viewing the sky. So what we say when we say constellations are the official 88 that astronomers recognize. One of which is Pegasus. Um, also up in the sky, kind of um, more toward the northern half of the sky, we can see this sort of W or uh, like an E kind of looks, looks like right now, uh, which marks the constellation of Cassiopeia, the queen. Very close by uh, Pegasus and Cassiopeia, we can also see uh, another constellation uh, known as Andromeda, the princess, or Andromeda, the maiden. Um, she, she actually shares one star with the square of Pegasus. So if you found the square of Pegasus, the fall square, you've also found the star that marks the head of the constellation Andromeda. 
So lots of really great constellations. Uh, if you're a constellation hunter, um, that you can step outside and find tonight. So, so looking sort of toward the south or the west, above your head, um, you can find the Summer Triangle and the Square of Pegasus are going to be sort of the easiest groups of stars to find, I think, anyway, um, up in the sky. But moving ourselves back toward the south once again here. Um, my favorite thing to find in the sky during November is going to be the planet Mars. So one easy way to find planets in the sky is uh, a comment that I that I saw scrolling by, um, or or uh, or a question, um, and that is that planets don't twinkle in the sky, but stars do. So if you watch stars very closely, they'll look like they twinkle, um, kind of look like they're almost moving a little bit, or sometimes getting a little brighter or a little fainter. But planets don't do that. Planets are a nice, steady brightness. So that's one way you can tell a planet from a star. The other way to find them is, well, that planets usually are really, really bright. So Jupiter, for example, we saw earlier, is really, really bright. But also the planet Mars, which is located over here, is also very, very bright, even brighter than Jupiter is, at least in the early parts of, uh, of the month of November. So if you've been following along uh, with our uh, Planetarium online shows for the past few months, um, you might remember us talking about a rover that was launched back in July that is currently on its way to Mars. So this rover named Perseverance was launched in July, but even though it, it was launched over three months ago, it still has not yet made it to Mars. Even though Mars is pretty close to us, relatively speaking, compared to other planets, it still takes a long time to get to Mars. As of right now, Perseverance is about 31 million miles away from the Earth. So far, it's traveled over 150 million miles so far in its journey. But it still does have a pretty long way to go. Right now, it's kind of between our planet Earth and planet Mars. But it won't actually make it to Mars until this coming February, February 18th if I have my, uh, my dates correct. So Perseverance, I'm super excited for. Um, I guarantee you in February, uh, we'll, be doing, we'll be doing a show about Perseverance. We'll talk about it uh, either earlier in the month or later in the month. We'll talk about it a whole lot more um, once it gets nice and close or after it lands on Mars on February 18th. Perseverance is going to be landing, though, in a really interesting location on Mars, a location called Jezro Crater. So the goal of Perseverance is to help us better understand if there could have been life on Mars way back in the past, right? We're talking three and a half billion years ago. Because way back then, Mars had liquid water on its surface three and a half billion years ago. And at that time, Jezero Crater would have been full of water. It was a lake back then. So by landing Perseverance here, we think it gives us the best chance to find evidence of ancient life. So when Perseverance lands, it's going to have a lot of really cool tools with it. It's going to have a drill on the end of this robotic arm, lots of cameras, um, to help us analyze Mars and to help us better understand if Mars could have had life way, 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 way back in its ancient past. We're talking, again, three and a half billion years ago. But along with Perseverance is also going to be a little drone or a little helicopter named Ingenuity, which will actually fly through the thin atmosphere of Mars for just a few hundred feet at a time. Right, so it'll fly for a few hundred feet at a time, allowing it to sort of scout ahead for future locations for Perseverance to, uh, to eventually check out. So uh, uh, I, for one, cannot wait 
to see what perseverance helps us learn because Mars is my favorite planet. Mars, I think, has the most interesting mystery of any planet, right? We think three and a half billion years ago, the conditions could have been right for Mars to have life on its surface. We just need to find evidence of it to know for sure. And so perseverance is our best tool so far to help us do that. So let's move back into our uh, southern sky now. Um, we'll put our markers back around all three of our planets, once the markers load anyway. So all during November, you'll be able to find Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. Every night in November, every single one, you'll be able to find these same three planets. So, uh, yeah, so I'm so excited for Perseverance. Very, very excited. Um, cool. So let me, let me scroll through our chat real quick, see if there's any questions we can answer. Um, for the rest of the show, we'll be looking at some things that are going to be rising in the eastern sky, uh, and we'll get higher up as we get later on into the month of November. Let me see. So yeah, so, uh, so Aaron wants to know how many rovers have been launched to Mars. So right now there's been, I believe seven is the right number. Um, uh, five of them have been launched by NASA. Um, a couple more by, uh, by, 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 other, by other organizations. I might be missing uh, uh, the correct number there. So Janice wants to know what time should we look for the planets? Um, so Janice, that's a really, really great question. Let me actually sort of show you that a little bit. So for Jupiter and Saturn, Jupiter especially, um, your best bet will be maybe an hour after the sun goes down, um, which is simply because... Um, as the night goes on, Jupiter and Saturn are going to get very low in the sky. So around 6.30 or 7 will be your best bet to see Jupiter and Saturn. Because around 9 o'clock, right, we're looking at 9 o'clock here, they've both gotten really, really low in the sky, a bit too low to actually see. Um, so around 6.30 or 7 tonight will be your best bet to see Jupiter or Saturn. And that'll hold throughout the whole month of November. Mars, on the other hand, it doesn't matter when you go outside to see it um, because it's going to stay up literally all night long, right? So anytime you go outside um, tonight or any night in November, um, it'll stay up in the sky. So, right, we're looking at 10 o'clock here, getting close to 11 o'clock. It's still nice and high in the sky. So my recommendation for Mars would be anytime it works for you, right? Anytime it works for you. Um, until about four in the morning, around four in the morning, it's start, starting to get low in the sky. But, uh, but yeah, Mars is a really great planet to find because it's going to be up pretty much all night long, giving us lots and lots of great chances to see it. And the moon will also be up as you get later on into the evening tonight. Um, I guess while we're looking here at the morning sky, this is a, a very nice transition that was not planned at all by me, um, but it's still going to work out very nicely for us today. Um, very low in the sky early in the morning, we're looking at 4.30 in the morning, we'll, we'll be able to uh, also see the planet Venus um, is going to be visible very low in the sky toward the east, nice and early in the morning. And I believe if my if my dates aren't mistaken here, um, we can also see the planet Mercury um, uh, during the month of November as well, um, which, which will be visible around this same time. Um, later on toward the middle of the month um, is when we'll be able to see Mercury a little bit better, but still gonna be a very hard planet to find, unfortunately. So now that we've gone all the way into the morning sky, let us actually take a moment and rewind a little bit here. And we're gonna look back at the evening sky. 
because right? that's when most of us are going to be doing our stargazing. I want to turn our attention over toward the eastern sky. So the eastern sky at about 7 a.m., 6.30, 7 a.m., has a couple of really, really interesting things to find just rising up above the horizon. Um, one of my favorite things to find in the sky, because it's really a marker of fall being here and winter uh, being very, very close by, fall and winter being my two favorite seasons of the year, is this little group of seven stars right here. Um, now, this is not just any old group of seven stars, right? It's got a, these have a special name, a couple, well, multiple names anyway. Um, these, uh, these are called the Pleiades. You may also heard them called the Seven Sisters. Um, and this is one of the first signs in the sky anyway that we're getting into the fall and into the winter as well. But the Pleiades are interesting, not just because they look cool in the sky, but because they're a really interesting group of stars for us to study. We're looking at a very beautiful picture of the Pleiades here, taken by the Hubble telescope. And these stars are interesting because they're all very young, and they were all born at the same time, roughly, from the same cloud of gas, right? We call this kind of grouping of stars an open star cluster. And the Pleiades are great, right? I mentioned that they're young stars. Now, calling a star young has always been kind of confusing to me. Um, because stars live for really, really long times. So when we say these stars are young, they're around 100 million years old, which is young for a star. But by studying places like the Pleiades, we get more understanding of how stars form, um, which is really important, right? Because the sun is a star, and it's interesting for us to learn how the sun formed as well. So a couple hundred million years ago, before the Pleiades was a group of stars, the Pleiades was really just a giant cloud of gas. And all stars begin their lives this way, as big clouds of gas. But over time, over millions of years, pieces of this cloud of gas can begin to shrink down. As this happens, as this cloud of gas sort of shrinks down and gets smaller and smaller, this cloud of gas begins to heat up and get hotter and get hotter and hotter and hotter. And really all that a star is, is a really hot ball of gas. So over time, this piece of a cloud of gas shrinks down into a ball of gas that gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and eventually, well, it gets so hot that a star forms. Nuclear fusion begins, hydrogen starts to get, uh, starts to get uh, fused into helium, and a star is born. The more gas that goes into forming a star, the bigger that the star is. And if there's enough gas left behind or dust left behind, well, we can form planets as well. And this is sort of a, a question that's really hard to answer. Uh, how exactly did the Earth form? Or how exactly did Mars form? Or Venus form? Or Mercury form? We don't know for sure the exact mechanisms that this happened. We know roughly, right? clouds of gas and rocks and dust condensing down to form these planets. But there's a lot of details that we're not super sure on. Our best understanding is that rocky planets like the Earth formed when pieces of rock sort of just over time clumped together into 
into planets, right, that we see today, into Earth, Mars, Jupiter. Or, so sorry, into, into Earth and Mars and Venus and Mercury. So in furthering our understanding of exactly how this happened, we're pretty lucky because we today have a lot of pieces of rock that are still existing here in the solar system today. We call them asteroids. So the solar system has a ton of asteroids and hundreds of thousands, millions even of asteroids that we find in our solar system. A good chunk of them live between Mars and Jupiter. We're seeing different types of asteroids here based on their colors, right? So these white ones are the ones uh, that we find in the asteroid belt, the red ones, uh, the, the red ones as well. And many of these asteroids have been left pretty much unchanged since the solar system began four and a half billion years ago. And so for a very long time, we have wanted to better study one of these asteroids. And we've gotten, we've been pretty successful at that. There's one asteroid here um, called Bennu. It's a kind of asteroid that we call a near-Earth asteroid, which just means that its orbit can get kind of close to the Earth's orbit, but really is no danger to ever collide with the Earth. But because it gets pretty close to the Earth, an asteroid like Bennu is a little bit easier to study than an asteroid really, really far away. But Bennu in particular is a really interesting asteroid to look at because of what it's made of. It's a very carbon-rich asteroid. We're looking at a beautiful sort of a high-res model of, of Bennu here. It's very rich in carbon, which we know is important to life. It's very bouldery, very rocky. It's a very interesting asteroid. And because it's close enough to the Earth, NASA actually has sent a spacecraft to visit this asteroid. The spacecraft itself uh, was launched back in 2016 and uh, has the wonderful name of OSIRIS-REx, which is an acronym which stands for the Origins Spectral Interpretation Resource Identification Security Regolith Explorer. I'm very glad they gave it an acronym. This spacecraft here um, has spent the last two years orbiting Bennu, very, very carefully studying it, mapping its surface. And a few weeks ago, OSIRIS-REx actually touched down on the surface of this asteroid. It's a hard thing to do, right? This, this, I'd like to compare it to trying to fit a spacecraft into a space of about two parking spaces. Now, I, for one, do not like parallel parking. I get very anxious when I parallel park. I'm very bad at it. So I cannot imagine trying to fit this spacecraft, OSIRIS-REx, into this little area here, which was its target. But we did it, right? And uh, a few weeks ago, we actually took a sample of this asteroid, right? We're seeing actual video from the spacecraft here. It touched down on the surface for about five seconds and was able to grab a sample of rocks and dust and dirt from the surface of this asteroid. And currently, we're hoping to have this sample back on the Earth in September of 2023 with the goal of using this to help us better understand how the Earth formed and what the Earth was like in its very, very early, early years. So I'm excited. Now, I should note this is not the first time this has been done. There have been two uh, uh, Japanese spacecraft that have also sampled uh, uh, an, an, uh, an asteroid. So it's going to be the third time humans have done this. Uh, it's been done by a Japanese spacecraft twice so far. Um, and because each asteroid is different, right, a sample of Bennu is different than what we've learned from any other asteroid before. So um, something cool to uh, keep in the back of your mind for September of 20, 
23. So all of this, right, the Pleiades, this asteroid, and other places like it can give us really interesting hints as to how our solar system was born, as to how stars are born. Well, there's lots to learn from looking at things that we can actually see in our sky right now. Let's see, so, um, so Trent wants to know, and uh, Christy also wants to know, um, what, is, what is old for a star? It's a good question. So stars um, live different amounts of time based on how big they are. So a really big star lives a shorter life. We're talking less than a billion years for really big stars. Smaller stars, though, live very long. For example, a star like the Sun will live for a total of around 10 billion years. But there are stars around today that are, that are almost as old as the universe, right? So there are stars that we observe today that are 12, 13 billion years old. So I guess that's old for a star, right? Over 10 billion years is what I would call an old star, right? Those are the, those are the sort of early generations of stars. Um, but different, different stars have different sort of lifespans to them, which includes the sun, right? Because the sun is a star. And the sun today is around five-ish billion years old. And the sun will continue as it is today for about another five billion years. But looking in our sky right now, we can find this reddish star here called Aldebaran. It's one of my favorite stars because it gives us a really good example of what's going to happen to the sun in, in four or five billion years. Because Aldebaran today is around the same mass as the sun, but it is way, way bigger. Right, so here's a model of Aldebaran, a red giant star. We'll put next to it a model of our own sun. Aldebaran is around 50 times the size of our sun, but they're around the same mass. So we think in around 5 billion years, the sun will actually look a whole lot like Aldebaran. It'll grow about 40 or 50 times its current size and is going to change quite a bit in that, in that time, as you, well, might imagine. So, today the sun is going, is going strong, right? It'll continue as it is for about 5 billion years. Fusing hydrogen into helium is what powers the sun. But as time goes by, the sun will eventually start to run out of fuel. As this happens, the sun is going to start to kind of balloon up and get bigger. At that point, it will swallow up Mercury. It will swallow up Venus. It will eventually swallow up the Earth as well. Again, not for 5 billion years. Nothing for us to worry about. It'll live as a red giant for a few hundred thousand, or sorry, a few hundred million years, burning helium. But eventually, the sun's fuel will totally run out. At that time, the outer layers of the star are going to begin to expand and drift away into space, as what's left of the core of the star shrinks and turns into what we call a white dwarf, a much denser star that's no longer undergoing fusion. Um, and will continue like this for a few trillion years. So. Around this time, the sun will have changed completely. But, um, but again, this won't happen for billions of years, right? So it's nothing we need to be afraid of. It's just pretty cool to know what's going to happen to the sun. And we learn about what's going to happen to the sun by studying other stars that are further along in their lifespans than our sun is. A star like Aldebaran, right? Which we can see just rising above the east around 8 o'clock this, or around 7, 8 o'clock this evening. It'll be very, very low, low, low in the sky. So something that we can look for.
So, um, looking at the time now, we're looking at about 1.50, and that is about all the stuff that I had to share with you today. We've talked about a lot today, right? We saw planets you can find in the southern sky, right? We've seen the star Aldebaran. We've seen the Pleiades. We saw some constellations, right? We saw Pegasus. We saw the Summer Triangle constellations. There's so much you can look out for in your sky in the month of November. And um, we'll be back with our next Planetarium online show um, using our new schedule. Um, again, if you, if you miss this from earlier um, when we introduced the show, um, our schedule is going to be changing a little bit as the Science Center is, is now open again. We're going to be moving our uh, Planetarium online schedule to once per month, usually on the first Thursday of every month at 5 o'clock p.m. So our next Planetarium online stream is going to be uh, December 3rd, at 5 o'clock p.m. And I will be here talking with you about the December sky. Um, uh, in the meantime, if you want to come check us out at Liberty Science Center, um, uh, we're going to be open um, for extended hours tomorrow. We open uh, uh, all, uh, all, all weekend um, celebrating uh, the Rubik's Cube. Uh, in the planetarium, um, we will be showing a brand new 80s laser show, which I cannot wait um, uh, to, uh, to, to run for you all, uh, was made by Krista, uh, who, who many of you recognize from some of our other shows. So, uh, you can come check that out in the Planetarium. Um, and as always, if you'd like to support Planetarium Online and the Liberty Science Center, a great way to do that is by visiting us, but you, uh, you can also use the donation button somewhere around you right now, um, or somewhere around me right now, somewhere, somewhere around here. Um, if you'd like to, and if you're able to support Liberty Science Center. Um, so that's the end of our time today, um, but I do want to stick around for at least the next five minutes and answer some of your questions that we haven't had time to answer so far. So if you've got questions, you can go ahead and enter them into the comment section, um, and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, so Audrey, to answer your question about what is the smallest constellation, um, I could be wrong about this, but I believe the smallest constellation is a little tiny constellation called, uh, called Canis Minor. So Canis Minor is a constellation that you can actually see very, very late in the evening tonight. Or sorry, Canis Minor, not Canis Major, Canis Minor. So Canis Minor will be up in the sky around like 11 o'clock or so. We'll go ahead and show you exactly uh, where that is. It's actually right beneath, uh, right beneath the moon tonight. So Canis Minor is just made up of two stars right here. Uh, as a constellation, these two stars make the shape of a of a little puppy dog, a little adorable puppy dog named Canis Minor, the little dog. So that is the smallest constellation, I believe. I could be mistaken about that, um, um, but I believe that is the smallest. So uh, Sruby wants to know, what is, the, what is the largest constellation? That is such a good question. Um, I believe the largest constellation is named, uh, is Virgo, which is not visible right now. I believe Virgo is the largest constellation. Let me see. So any other questions that, that we can answer so far? So uh, Angelique, uh, so so uh, Angelique wanted to know, does the uh, so will the Earth and other planets last longer than the Sun? Um, that's a really good question. Um, kind of a morbid answer, unfortunately. So the rocky planets will not live longer than the Sun. 
um, at least the first three rocky planets. So when the sun sort of expands and gets bigger, Mercury, Venus, and Earth are going to be vaporized and swallowed by the sun. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune will continue continue living. Um, but the Earth, Venus, and Mercury, unfortunately, will be swallowed by the sun. But again, that won't happen for five billion years, right? Nothing for us to worry about. Um, but uh, um, unfortunately, when the sun goes, so will the Earth. Um, again, five billion years, right? Very, very long time. Let's see, let's see. Any other questions we can answer? So uh, Christy wants to know, is Mars closest to the sun? So the closest planet to the sun is the planet Mercury. Uh, Mars is planet number four, with the Earth being planet number three, and Venus being planet number two. Um, so Mercury is the closest planet to the sun. Let's see. So, um, so Nancy wanted to know the names of the four stars in the fall square. Um, so Nancy, I do not know all the names of the stars in the fall square, unfortunately. Um, I have forgotten them as time has gone by. So maybe Mike, maybe Mike knows uh, the names of those four stars in the fall square or can look it up for you because I have forgotten over time, unfortunately. Which happens, uh, which happens, right? It happens. All right, so. Oh yeah, and, and, and I'm, I'm seeing Mike uh, uh, mention, you can, you can kind of combine four constellations, a big like, Frankenstein of, 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 of one massive constellation, um, which, is, which is always a fun thing to do. Again, visible in the, uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. And actually, because we're getting a few questions about the um, sort of the structure of the solar system here, let's actually move back here to, so, so we can kind of look at how things are in the solar system. So we're looking here at least at the inner part of the solar system, right? We see Earth is planet number three. We can also see uh, all, all of our asteroids, again, popping back up. Let me get rid of those. There we go. So Mercury is, is, is this little, little white line uh, making very good time orbiting around the sun. We have Venus, Earth, and Mars um, as, uh, as the uh, rest of the rocky planets, Jupiter, Planet number five as the first of the gas giant planets. So, uh, Kira wants to know, is Mars closer to the moon? So Mars is actually pretty far away from the moon. Um, Mars today is like over 40 million miles away from the moon. The moon is very close to the Earth, though, about 250,000 miles from the Earth. So Terry wants to know, what is the possibility of seeing another alien life form in our lifetime? You know what? That is a fascinating question. I would say the chances of that are very, 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 very low. Because space is really, really, really big. Um, meaning, it's really hard to study and get information about super distant planets. So even though we've found a lot of planets that in theory could host some kind of life, we don't know for sure, um, it's hard to learn about them because they're so far away. So in our lifetimes, um, I would say almost certainly not, though I will never rule anything out. 2020 has been quite a year, so maybe... Uh, <laughs> Nobody knows uh, for sure what is uh, what's going to happen, obviously, but I'd say extremely, extremely unlikely, just because space is so big. There's so much stuff out there.
All right. So I believe those are all the questions that I am seeing right now. So I would like to thank everyone once again for joining us uh, today for our tour of the November skies. I hope to see you next month, December 3rd at 5 p.m. Um, for our next show that I'll, that I'll be here for, showing you around the December night sky. But until then, thank you all so much once again. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your Thursday uh, and a great rest of your week. Take care.